Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. I see that we have some participants joining, but I would like to go ahead and start by welcoming you all to this webinar. This is hosted by UNICEF and IPCIG. And this webinar is on the social protection and universal child benefits, uh, sharing experiences, hearing some lessons learned and some global perspectives on these two topics in preparation for the upcoming Global South-South Development Expo. The GSSD, as it's known, is held annually, and it's going to be taking place next month in mid-September in Thailand. So this webinar is a precursor to that event. If we can go ahead and please go on. Thank you so much. So this is our very rough and quick agenda for today. You see we have a packed agenda with some very uh, dynamic and interesting speakers. So I would like as soon as possible to get going on those, but just to let you know that this webinar is going to serve as a platform as part of the South-South cooperation to share these lessons and innovations. And it's really oriented to start dialogue and hopefully to open up some networks to be able to explore these issues further, both within the webinar and outside. Now today in regards to speakers, we have several. First, we're going to be starting off with myself. My name is Taylor Spadafora. I am the Social Protection Specialist in the UNICEF Regional Office for Eastern and Southern Africa. And I am very happy to introduce uh, Nicholas Stefan, who is the um, South-South Cooperation Officer for UNICEF Brazil. Nicholas is gonna be providing us some opening remarks to get the webinar going. He has over 12 years of experience with UNICEF and Nicholas is actually very well placed to be the opener for this webinar as he formed part of the team in UNICEF Brazil that started and set up the first ever UNICEF South-South Cooperation Unit at country level and that was back in 2011. So we're very pleased to have him to share his, his reflections. After that, we have a panel of four speakers who are going to be setting the stage for us and sharing some examples. First, we have Natalia Winder Rossi. She is our global director for social policy based in New York. And under her portfolio, she leads UNICEF's social policy programmatic work. Now, I'm sure most of you know what that includes, but for those of you who don't, that is all everything, child poverty, social protection, public financial management for children, local governance, and more recently, as of 2020, also leading the urban portfolio for UNICEF. Next, we'll hear from Sarah Shahyar from uh, UNICEF Thailand. She is the chief of social policy in that office, and she has over 20 years of experience with the UN, including nine with UNICEF and a lot of experiences to share. After Sarah, we will turn to Remy Pujois. He is the social policy manager in the Tunisia country office, but he covers child-sensitive social policy in the entire Maghreb region. And he has also shared some experiences working with various um, positions in ministries of finance, in other UN agencies such as FAO, as well as the World Bank. And Remy has also served in several country offices and in the West and Central Africa Regional Office. And finally, we will wrap up our presentations from Anais Vibranovsky, who is a researcher with IPCIG. She provides technical assistance on social protection in uh, the Maghreb, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa regions. And she has facilitated this webinar series on social protection system reforms for the South-South and Triangular Cooperation Initiative. So she's gonna be a great resource to hear from today. After our presentations, we will have a quick Q&A and then we will move to some closing remarks and reflections. We are very lucky today to have two very distinguished women on our panel. First, we have Zhao, sorry, Grace Wong, Zhao Jun. Uh, she is the deputy director for the UN Office for South-South Cooperation. And she has actually created the South-South Galaxy, which is a global and UN system-wide digital platform for knowledge sharing and partnership brokering. So she's a great asset in terms of the South-South Cooperation and really learning from each other um, and making it work. And then we will have remarks from Christine Muhigana, who is our UNICEF representative in the Republic of South Africa. Christine is coming with over 30 years of experience in the United Nations. She's worked in various positions, but they include strategic planning, partnerships, and gender, and also in a diversity of countries from Mauritania, Cote d'Ivoire, to HQ, to Central African Republic, of course, South Africa, where she currently uh, resides, as well as serving as the Deputy Regional Director for the UNICEF West and Central Africa Regional Office. Now, we will have a Q&A session after the presentations, 
but I would like to invite all participants to please make use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you can, that will serve as a really great time uh, keeper for us and enable panelists to answer questions in real time after they've made their presentations. If you can please just make sure to state your name and organization, as well as if there's a specific audience that you're directing your question to so that they can answer it. And with that, I'm very happy to turn over to Nicholas for opening remarks. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you very much, Taylor. And uh, thank you all so very much to the organizers for inviting the UNICEF Brazil Country Office to, to take part in this important webinar. Uh, as the title suggests, uh, there is uh, an urgent need to strengthen the social protection system and widen the access to child allowances across the globe, uh, especially in this current moment of uh, COVID-19 recovery. And uh, as many of you probably know, uh, Brazil is famous for its uh, robust social protection system. Uh, however, as COVID hit the country, it became very clear to us that also Brazil has gaps that need to be addressed. So uh, we in Brazil, we are currently expanding uh, our programming in social protection throughout the country uh, to support the government and partners in responding to these challenges. At the same time, uh, and as Taylor uh, mentioned, we are also moving ahead with our long-standing partnership with uh, the Brazilian Cooperation Agency to expand our trilateral South-South cooperation program. Uh, and as we do, we build on over 10 years of experience, as, uh, as, as Taylor mentioned, uh, and, and also a set of recommendations that came out of an external evaluation that we did of, of our program in 2019. And that evaluation covered collaboration between Brazil, UNICEF and 16 countries. Uh, the great majority of all these initiatives uh, have been implemented in the, in the area of social protection. Um, and while we are also expanding in other areas, social protection remains as a key component uh, of the UNICEF Brazil South-South uh, agenda. And while we move ahead, uh, fostering cooperation between Brazil and other countries, we're also working closely with the Brazilian Cooperation Agency to, to strengthen the institutional setup of Brazil's South-South cooperation agenda. And this includes uh, development of programming tools, guidelines, as well as a system for monitoring, evaluation and learning that we are currently working on. And in parallel to this, we're also investing resources in evidence generation, which was also one of the recommendations of the, of the evaluation that I mentioned. And our expectations is that uh, by mapping out and documenting what Brazil has to offer in terms of child sensitive public policies and programs, including in the area of social protection, we will be better placed to respond to demands from other countries. And uh, by looking also at both national and subnational levels, we believe that the knowledge that these efforts will generate can also benefit Brazil and inform exchanges of experiences and, and policy dialogues, both internationally, but also within the country. Uh, much of what I'm mentioning right now is, is still in the making, but I believe this, uh, this webinar provides an important opportunity to share some of these updates, as we hope and believe that the work that we are developing in Brazil can feed into the continuous process of exchanges that this webinar sets out to promote, uh, which in turn can take us towards an ever more uh, systematic engagement in South-South cooperation across the organization, as well as with our partners. Uh, we do believe that South-South cooperation can serve as an important strategy to advance towards improved and more child-centered social protection systems across the globe and, and that the organizations, organizations such as UNICEF uh, have an important role to play here. And it, it is in this spirit that we will also take part in the forthcoming Global South-South Cooperation Expo that Taylor mentioned, uh, together with our uh, Brazilian counterparts. With that, um, I wish us all a productive webinar, and I hope today's discussions can take us one step forward towards the stronger South-South Cooperation Agenda for Children. I thank you very much. Over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicholas an absolutely excellent opener to, to the content that we have coming up. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Natalia Vinder Rossi to please provide us with a global perspective uh, from UNICEF on social protection and child benefits. Natalia, please over to you. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, good afternoon to some of you. Thank you so much, Taylor. Let me just um, give me two seconds so I can share uh, my screen. Um, two seconds, my technologically challenged. Um, process. I think it's coming. Can you see it uh, in full screen? No, not yet. One second. Ah, computer today is not. Okay. There you go. 
Taylor, can you say, okay, great. So once again, good good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, very excited to be here today with all of you in this very timely and important webinar. Um, and also, of course, to share the, the panel with uh, my brilliant colleagues um, to share one of the, in, a lot of the innovation that we've seen um, in, the, in the last years in terms of social protection coverage and, and child benefits. Um, for this first presentation, I just wanted to provide some reflections from the global level or where we are in terms of social protection um, after particularly our, our COVID response, but not only, and some of the challenges that we still have moving, moving forward. Um, of course, this doesn't work. Okay, this is, this slide's moved. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So maybe to to give a little bit of, of context, um, I think we are in a very critical momentum um, for for child poverty and social protection. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of the progress that we saw in the last year has been severely stalled um, due to the compounded impacts of climate, COVID, and of course uh, the pandemic. And we we have estimated that we have at least a, an additional 100 million children living in poverty um, as of as of last year. And this is something. Thing that is impacting, of course, uh, low income and poor countries, but not only is a phenomenon that it's a, uh, that is happening across middle income and high income countries where both poverty and inequality are increasing. And it's not an issue not only because of the ad, ad aggregate uh, more number of, of children, but also new profiles of children living in, in poverty, meaning children that have not experienced poverty before are now falling into poverty. Families and uh, and children that had were able to, to move out of poverty um, are falling back again. Um, and in, in different contexts, for instance, an increase in urban areas, an increase, of course, in humanitarian conflict settings, and families working in the formal and care sector, among others. We recognize this as a poverty, but also as a care crisis where many women and girls were disproportionately impacted by, by the crises um, with a lot of um, income, but also social impacts, um, and therefore a, a renewed approach on how we're going to address um, both poor poverty and care. Um, even before the pandemic, we, we had significant gaps in terms of financing of SDGs, particularly around the social sectors. And this has continued to, to become a, a major challenge as we move forward. And we have, of course, as always, social sector spending at risk, um, and even more so uh, given the crowding out around debt repayments. Um, and in terms of social protection, we continue to have a very uh, big coverage uh, gap, uh, particularly around children, but I'll go that uh, in more in detail in a bit. Um, I think that we all here uh, can agree that social protection has been recognized as a proven strategy for reducing child poverty and poverty more in general. And this is based, this was recognized, of course, in the Agenda 2030 um, with our new, with our SDG 1, but also a thanks to the very solid evidence of impacts that UNICEF and partners have been able to gather across different children's outcomes, both social and economic, in terms of inclusion and gender equality. Um, and, the, and, the, and I think COVID also put very clearly on the table that this is relevant, particularly for the poorest, but it's relevant across all contexts. Um, in every single country, it was important to see the, 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 the role that social protection plays and need to play um, in addressing risk, in supporting families, and in helping to build resilience, um, as well as a strategy that has been recognized not only in development context, let's say, but also in the different strategies put in place at global level around uh, climate change, around conflict, um, and both recognized by development as well as humanitarian actors, um, really looking at the potential of well-designed social protection programs for, for resilience building. I think that the response, the, the COVID response was, was, was critical for the social protection sector. We saw, I think, an, uh, it's fair to say an unprecedented and impressive response across more than 200 countries, across many types of programs um, uh, based on national systems, as well as, of course, in some cases, adding new programs. Um, cash transfers had a pr prominent role um, um, in terms of coverage, one of the most used uh, instruments, but not only. We also saw other types of instruments being used to cover different populations, such as unemployment benefits, for example, health insurance. I think it was important um, as one of the pillars of the response and really elevating once more the, the important role that social protection has in crisis response, but also I think showing 
that government systems are able to effectively and rapidly respond with existing systems, um, showing that when there's political will, financing is, is available. Um, and changing also, I think, if I may say a little bit of, around the narrative that, that social protection is not just only a band-aid or, or only needed for the extreme poor, but something that it's that it's critical, uh, a critical pillar for every single sector in society to be able to respond, but also to, to maintain many of, 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 of the current services running. Um, I think COVID also provided some space for key innovations um, because of those restrictions. They were, I think, more a space to leverage digital technologies, for example, to expand uh, electronic payments, but also for us in UNICEF to make sure that we were providing income support, but also um, access to critical social services and health education and others. It confirmed from our perspective the very important role of social protection, particularly in this context, helping, of course, to address um, immediate income and em employment losses helping to absorb the new costs that were created by, by the health and economic pandemic in terms of healthcare, but also in terms of care. Um, and in some cases, also minimizing the impossible choice on whether to uh, abide uh, around social distancing, for example, measures vis-a-vis -vis going to work and earning, earning a, a living. Um, but I think that um, it, it was also clear that even though it was it was important and it was an unprecedented and critical response, that the pandemic also put very clearly on the table some of the challenges and gaps that we still um, face in, in social protection. Um, I think that there, there are four big categories, let's say, of, of gaps of challenges that we've been uh, following from UNICEF. One, in terms of coverage. Two, in terms of adequacy. Uh, third, in terms of risk, risk and for programming, and then fourth, in terms of financing. Doesn't mean that these are the only ones, but these are key ones that we have been focusing in the past um, year or so. And let me just go through quickly uh, what this means. So in terms of coverage, um, despite the progress, despite the, the, the unprecedented response, we still have a very strong gap in terms of coverage, particularly when we are talking about children. Only one in four children globally um, uh, have access to, this is wrong, it's, do not receive, it's the other way around. One in four children, only one in four receive uh, access to social protection. And of course, unfortunately, the coverage is lowest um, in places with highest child poverty rates, including in, in fragile contexts. Um, and I think this provides and enhances the risk of an, an even recovery, particularly in those countries that have not been able to um, uh, expand coverage across different, different population groups. Um, but it's not only around covering people um, and ensuring coverage, but also within that uh, at, uh, commitment to, to expansion of coverage, the importance of ensuring that we have adequate design of programs, that we are effectively reaching the most ex excluded population, you know, the really implementing the leaving no one behind principle, making sure the girls, women, children with disability, migrant families, children in urban areas and others are systematically included in um, our response response and our design of social protection systems, particularly national systems. Um, just to give you an example, unfortunately, in terms of gender, um, the COVID response was gender neutral or gender blind, um, where um, after a review from UNDP and UN Women, we saw that you know, less than one in five social protection measures, for example, address gender, even though it was clearly the opportunity to enhance responses around gender and care. Um, also, and when we're designing the specific programs, how do we better integrate um, the added costs or the other elements that are needed to really make sure that we see the impacts that we want to see and address the different types of vulnerabilities or the specific vulnerabilities of different groups? Um, for instance, how do we make sure that when we are reaching children with disabilities, we're adding the extra costs uh, around caring for children and in, in benefit levels and how we can translate that to make sure that the, the support that are that is provided it is really impactful. But also from a more, I think, systems uh, perspective, I think that the response in cash was key. The, this was a, a income impact type pandemic, but also, as I said before, reflected that there were many other types of social protection that were also critical needed and also need to have the same attention financially and, and investment wise and expansion wise uh, to make sure that we have a comprehensive response. And we're talking, of course, about health insurance, affordable care, um, the role that we see in terms of family family policies, for example, um, and making sure that when we are thinking about what are the, the priorities when we're thinking about 
spending systems. We look at the income-based approaches, but also at the wider range of interventions that have proven to be equally important and making a difference, uh, particularly in excluded populations. The third gap um, is around risk-informed programming. So um, we know from uh, the, the assessment of evidence that um, the, were, particularly those countries that had strong national social protection systems were were those that were better equipped, let's say, to response. But we also know that they were um, not always uh, covering all the populations that needed to be covered, that there was still a need to design parallel systems, that not all countries had uh, thought about having contingency financing for particular expansions that were needed in terms of crises. Um, there's a mixed review of the timeliness of the response. So even though there was commitment and resources, systems sometimes took longer than expected to provide the support uh, that needed. And we still have a gap in making sure the risks elements are not systematic considered when designing social protection systems. And I think this is for us in units of a big priority of work uh, moving forward. Um, making sure that when we are designing social protection, we integrate it as part of good programming, um, and integrating elements of risks in design and implementation, making sure that we are supporting design that is adequate, but also that is able to, the systems are better able and quickly able to respond to, to crises. Um, and of course, explicit to integrating the broad range of vulnerability and, and compounding risks. So not only from the social and economic perspective, which is what we traditionally include when we're designing programs, but also elements of climate risk and conflict related risk. And that will provide us a much more broader, I think, um, set of tools to be able to respond earlier, better, and more effectively at moving, moving forward forward. And last but not least, a very, of course, important critical gap around sustainable financing. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think there was a lot of political will shown and showing that even that many countries were able to expand and allocate resources to social protection within their existing fiscal space, moving things around, um, taking a lot of different financing modalities uh, from domestic financing, uh, you know, relying on ODA and other resources. Um, but uh, we definitely saw that some of those programs were temporary. Um, there, we are now at the risk of many of those programs uh, stopping or re reverting back to initial coverage levels. So this, of course, put, uh, heightens the risk of an even recovery. Um, we continue to have a, a very big gap in terms of you know, having social protection floors across countries. And this is the figure that was um, estimated by ILO in terms of what, what is needed to close that gap. In, in most of, of low-income of low countries. Um, but from us, from UNICEF, um, the, one of the key messages was not only focusing on putting on, uh, making visible the gap and the need for sustainability, but also that, that we needed to, um, in this particular context of economic contraction, making sure that we were at, to a minimum, um, prioritizing and protecting social spending uh, within government government budgets. Um, unfortunately, the first um, sectors to be cut or be affected in these types of contexts are social sectors, and I think we need to make sure these are protected um, as a cornerstone for any attempt to recovery. And also working with government and partners in making sure that we um, are able to improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, the transparency of that social protection financing and identifying um, new ways of, of covering some of the gaps um, and, and making sure that we have the systems uh, strong enough um, to respond to, to, to the crises that unfortunately will, will continue to, to happen. So I invite you to, when you have a time, to take a look at, at our call for action on financing and inclusive recovery, focusing particularly on critical social sectors, including social protection. Um, so in this context, I think um, UNICEF have revamped its commitment to, to this work. We, can, we work across all country contexts around uh, uh, really making sure that the right of social protection is realized, that we're working with countries to have to, to reach the progressive realization of social protection, where we see universal child benefits, which is a big part of our discussion today, as one of the critical entry points to start thinking about universal coverage, uh, making sure that we have social protection systems that are multi-sectoral, but also inclusive and gender sensitive, that we have, um, that we support governments to um, ensure that there is uh, national budgets that are effectively allocated and protected for social protection, and of course, that we're developing systems that are risk-informed and shock-responsive. 
Uh, many of you may know that we have a new strategic plan that started this year in UNICEF where we have a, a standalone and specific pillar or what we call goal area around um, social protection and, and child poverty really to um, put very clear on the table our commitment and, and the urgency of addressing child poverty if we want to have any chance at an inclusive and green economy and the importance of really scaling up social protection, not just as a crisis instrument, but as a pillar of resilience building and, and inclusion. Um, this this uh, new goal area really uh, deepens and reaffirms our commitment to our longstanding work in, in terms of expansion of coverage, particularly universal grants, and continue to work with many governments in, in helping them to enhance their systems approach from a multisectoral, from a data evidence and evidence perspective, but also, um, uh, let's say, a rebam commitment around critical game changers that we think need to be prioritized and scale up to address some of the gaps that I just uh, mentioned. So having uh, really a, a commitment around gender transformative systems and the scale up of family friendly policies, uh, working around the systematic inclusion of children with disabilities and children on the move, um, strengthening financial strategies and putting on the table our comprehensive offer or approach in, in context of fragility and humanitarian crisis where we are working around systems, but also delivering um, life-saving humanitarian cash when needed and using those experiences to also build more sustainable and medium-term um, approaches. Natalia, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> and then my last slide is um, just to open up uh, the leeway for, for the next presentations. You know, the, the, the focus that we definitely put on universal child benefits is responding to all the, the things that I said until now, the importance, um, you know, addressing the low coverage. Um, we see it as an entry point and a foundation for universality. Um, we see it as critical to, to ensure any, any design around inclusion or shock responsive. Um, but really, we understand that there's very different ways and pathways to reach in universal child benefits. Um, we've seen the evidence, but this is really the moment to be to share among different countries that have been able to reach that level of, of coverage and, um, and prioritization session and, and see what are, what are the things that are at work, what are the challenges and how we can work together in addressing some of those. So that's it. I'll stop here and thank you so much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Natalia. You've covered quite a bit in a short amount of time and really set up well for our next uh, round of presentations. So colleagues, now we're going to move from global level down to uh, specific country examples. I'd like to invite Sarah to please go ahead and share your screen and get started from Thailand. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And thank you, Natalia, for the fantastic um, presentation. Um, a very warm welcome to um, all of you who are, um, who, are, who are joining today. Thank you um, for your interest. Um, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be presenting a proposal for integrating the multiple child benefits that exist in Thailand, uh, which will essentially mean an integration between the contributory and non-contributory child allowances in the country. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, Thailand has progressed from a poor to an upper middle income country in less than a generation. The country has also been widely praised for its fast and sustaining growth, uh, combined with its success in eliminating extreme poverty over the past few decades. However, like many other countries, poverty remains strongly linked to life cycle risks and children continue to be overly represented in the poor population. As you can see in this graph, uh, poverty among 0 to 17 age uh, group is as high as 10%, while the national average is around 6.8%. That is to say, families with uh, children are more likely to live in poverty. And the most important factor here is informal or formal sector employment. We have seen that poverty rates in households headed by someone working in the informal sector is 9.9% compared to only 1.5% uh, for those working in, in, in the informal sector. So, um, and, and let me remind you, uh, high levels of informality continue to plug the labor market in Thailand. According to uh, the informal employment survey of 2020, around 54% of all workers uh, were in informal uh, employment and of whom around 45% were uh, women. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, the COVID 
has had an unprecedented impact on the economic growth, as well as jobs and incomes. The pandemic brought to the surface a significant decrease of vulnerability among a large part of the population, but also demonstrated the effectiveness of social protection to mitigate the impact of the crisis on the most vulnerable. The country is recognized for its fast uh, and uh, effective response in containing the spread of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, but also uh, for its timely relief responses. Uh, next slide, please. Modeling using household level data shows that um, without the special social protection measures that were introduced at the early stages of the pandemic, poverty would have increased by several fold. Yet, when we look at um, data from before and after COVID, again, we see the increase in poverty in most, is, is most pronounced among the child population. And again, that is to say that families with children in Thailand have been hit hardest by COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see um, uh, the age structure of the country has been mapped over income this size. Again, highlighting the vulnerability of the child population. This is a real challenge for a country that is struggling with the so-called middle income trap and a large informal sector, and also very rapidly aging population. All these are closely related to the issues of human capital, and they all call for more and better investment in children. Um, next slide, please. Now let's take a quick um, look at the country's social protection system. A recent diagnostic review conducted by ILO, UNICEF and other UN partners showed that the social protection in, in Thai, system in Thailand disproportionately benefits the upper strata of the income uh, distribution. This is due to the civil service pension schemes, um, which mainly cover upper income households working in the public sector. So, um, and that is why the non-contributory social protection, uh, including the child support grant, the old age allowance, disability grant, and the state welfare court are all very clearly progressive. In terms of the value of the transfers, the non-contributory benefits cover only a small part of the minimum expenditure required to meet beneficiaries' basic needs, while the average value of contributory retirement payments, for instance, uh, represents around 45% of average income per capita or 81% of average consumption per capita of the, of the targeted population group. Uh, next slide, please. When it comes to public expenditure on various categories of social protection, we see that family allowances overall account for 0.5% of GDP and around 10.8% of social protection spending. Uh, that is that is data from 2019. Within this broad category, close to 46% are, are distribu distributed through the civil service benefit schemes and the social security fund. 49% goes to the state welfare court, while the non-contributory child support grant accounts only for 5%. So we can see that the share of the non-contributory child benefits from the total social protection spending in the country remains still very limited. On the financing side, around 60% of the social protection system is financed through general taxation, while, as noted again, expenditure is highly skewed towards the civil service benefits. So again, highlighting the inequities in, in public spending on social protection in Thailand. Next slide, please. Child benefits in Thailand can be broadly categorized as contributory and non-contributory. They are these are administered by different by different ministries, different departments. But more importantly, the two schemes are not complementing one another in a way to provide a full coverage of all children in the age group. As the child support grant is only targeting young children from poor families, and the other one, the social security child benefits only targets children whose parents are part of the formal labor market. So um, there is a significant number of children that are currently uh, left out. We can assume that some of these children belong to well-to-do families, but there are certainly those who are not so well off, including those from full, poor families who have been excluded from the scheme or uh, what is known as the missing middle. This category of missing middle points to a section of the population who have been 
shown to be very vulnerable to shocks such as the one we are experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic, while they're often left out from the uh, non-contributory social assistance schemes. Um, move on, please. So the challenge here is to ensure that no child is left behind or excluded from child benefits. Overall, um, in the past uh, decade, there has been a public demand to make uh, the child support grant universal by expanding its coverage to all children. However, governments have been reluctant to expand this tax finance child benefit tool. Even the current government, whose major allied parties had pledged, pledged during the election campaign to make the child support grant universal, has been refusing to deliver the, on, on their promise. Uh, the main reason for, for their reluctance is said to be limited resources. But we also understand that there is a lack of a broad-based political buy-in for the proposal, mainly because politicians find it counterintuitive to distribute limited resources among those who, who they believe do not need it, especially when they are also constantly under the pressure to make decisions that entail a trade-off between expanding the coverage uh, and increasing the value of the benefits to a level that would be um, impactful. Recently, we put forth a proposal for the expansion of child uh, benefits to reach universal coverage with three po costed policy options. The first option is our decade-old proposal and advocacy message to expand the tax finance child support grant scheme with an increased benefit level to address the issues of coverage and adequacy. This is the same proposal that I was just mentioning has, has so far received um, um, little buy-in. Uh, the second and third options, however, are novel uh, and are based on a proposal to integrate the contributory and non-contributory child benefits into a multi-tiered benefit system that builds upon a foundation of tax finance guarantees for all children across the population with higher benefit levels benefits for, for families who contribute to the social security system so that an incentive to join the social social security system is, is also maintained. This model for benefits can be a powerful and efficient mechanism for reaching families of workers in the informal economy without having to deal with the persistent problem of exclusion error that we all know is almost inherent to the poverty targeted programs. Caregivers who are not part of social security system would receive an adequate guaranteed child benefit financed through general taxation. And those workers who contribute to the social security system will be entitled to minimum benefit from the tax finance child support plan, as well as a higher rate child allowance paid for through the contributory system. The value of transfer here uh, as you see in the uh, in the table, are still indicative and may need to be further adjusted. But the difference between option two and three is that option three adds an additional benefit level stratum, proposing a more equitable distribution of benefits, but at the same time, it also making the scheme more sophisticated with a means testing element uh, being introduced for those in the social security system. The expansion of benefit coverage proposed here is gradual under all options and full coverage uh, uh, is to be to be achieved by uh, 2028. Uh, next slide, please. The idea here is to have one child benefit system that is financed through general taxation as well as insurance uh, insurance contributions with an adequate tax finance benefit being guaranteed for every child. So the integrated system enables universal provision through a combination of contributory and non-contributory benefits, such as what already characterizes the health system in Thailand. This model promotes a move away from a residual poverty-targeted child benefit, that is the case now, to an approach that accounts for vulnerabilities and shocks in a broader sense and views child benefit and social protection in general as an integral part of social and economic policies in the country. So by removing the means testing element of the benefit for those outside the social security system, the model can address the problem of exclusion error, as well as the issue of the uh, middle, uh, missing middle, which uh, I was, I was um, and, uh, pointing to uh, a bit earlier. Next slide, please. It is, uh, important to note that in this model, 
the benefits will be highly redistributive since the benefits for both contributory and non-contributory schemes are flat rate. So those at the lower end of the income distribution should benefit the most in relative terms. So this model can also improve the equity of government spending. Um, Equally important is to ensure that benefit levels will not disadvantage anyone, meaning that no current beneficiary will be worse off. This consideration is well reflected in our proposed option 23, where everyone, including those in the social security system, will receive a higher total amount com compared to their uh, present uh, benefits. Um, when we consider strengthening domestic revenues for sustainable financing of social protection, it normally involves strengthening of progressive tax systems, improved financial management of government uh, programs, as well as extension of contributory mechanisms. So it is relevant to note that a multi-tier child benefit can, can potentially encourage formal employment among parents, especially women, who are not yet part of the formal labor force. Um, the proposed models, uh, model here does not imply a need to rehouse any of the existing programs from one department to another, but it does mean that the calculation of benefits will take into account both the contributory and non-contributory components, and therefore it requires the integration of data on payment system. So potentially uh, it enables further efficiency gains through the integration of coordination of various parts of the system, such as registration, case management, communications, and monitoring and evaluation. Finally, it is important to note that um, benefits do not operate, um, that child benefits do not operate in a, in a policy vacuum, both on the spending and financing side. Child benefits interact with other transfers um, and um, in this case, child benefits finance by contributions or contribution or combination of contributions and tax and taxes can offer sound solution to unlock the policy blockage resulting from a strict dichotomy between universal and targeted benefits. Um, we at UNICEF Thailand are conducting a feasibility assessment of this model at the moment, uh, which we hope can also uh, uh, next slide please, which we hope can also. Uh, attend to uh, um, some of the questions, especially on unintended consequences of such a system uh, being long or short term. Um, there are only a few countries uh, operating a similar model. And so we're very keen to learn from their experiences. Um, and um, and I, uh, in this webinar, actually, I, I very much look forward to, to engaging with you all further through the Q&A. Session. So thank you very much again for your attention and interest. Bravo, thank you, Sarah, right on time and, and really interesting stuff. So really appreciate it. Uh, Remy, while I invite you to come up and start sharing your screen, I would like to just remind all participants of the Q&A uh, function. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, please make sure you enter them in that, uh, in that box and we'll be able to get to them later. Thanks so much and over to you, Remy. Thank you so much, Taylor, and uh, up, uh, good uh, good afternoon, good morning to all participants. I'm uh, really glad uh, to be part of that uh, webinar to to yeah to share and to showcase the example of uh, Tunisia for uh, the beginning of the implementation of a universal child benefit approach in. Uh, during the context of the of the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe that this, uh, what Tunisia has done is a great example of, uh, even in the case of a crisis, there is an opportunity to advance the social protection floor agenda and also to, uh, to move toward, uh, towards the universal child ben benefit in a, in a country. So to to give you uh, to give to the audience some uh, some background related to the to the national context in uh, in Tunisia. So even before the the COVID nineteen, uh, Tunisia has been facing ten years of uh, political instability and also socio economic uh, challenge following the democratic revolution ten years ago. And so, for, in, for instance, in the last uh, 10 years, there was an increase in terms of uh, disparities, income inequality, and also there was a challenge related to, uh, to youth uh, unemployment. 
as you can imagine, these uh, challenges were uh, severely aggravated by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And uh, Tunisia GDP declined by more than 9% in uh, 2020. And uh, the lockdown also in European, in European countries and Tunisia uh, led to uh, widespread job and income losses and driving many uh, household and uh, citizen, uh, Tunisian citizens into poverty. In 2020, UNICEF made a simulation to uh, estimate what will be the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on children. And this study uh, demonstrated that uh, the increase of, po of child poverty will be even worse compared to the rest of the population, setting back the country as uh, a progress of the country by uh, 15 years to give you a sense of the impact of the COVID-19 on a country like, uh, like Tunisia. Also, as many countries, uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, and it was uh, showcased by Natalia at uh, the global level, the fiscal space in, uh, in Tunisia, which was already uh, tight, uh, become even uh, further constrained due to the increase of the spending to respond to the, to the impact of the COVID-19 and also due to the decrease of the fiscal revenue of the, of the state. So even before the, the impact of the COVID-19, Tunisia was already thinking about uh, launching, implementing a universal child benefit approach and UNICEF was working closely with the, with the government in that uh, regard. So as I said, uh, the children in Tunisia were more worse, uh, more affected than the rest of the population by, uh, by the COVID-19 uh, socioeconomic impact. But even before the poverty rate for, for, for children was almost the double compared to, uh, to adults in, uh, in Tunisia. And uh, I mentioned also earlier the, the disparities across the country and child poverty was uh, following the same trade. So for instance, in some uh, geographic area of Tunisia, child poverty is over 40%. While in, uh, in the area of Tunis, uh, we are below 8% uh, of child poverty. Uh, children were facing also uh, challenges in terms of uh, coverage by uh, the contributory and the non-contributory uh, social protection scheme. Uh, in Tunisia in 2019, uh, less than 60% of children were covered by uh, the social protection system. And in Tunisia, also one of the issue, one of the challenge we are we are facing is the heavy weight of the subsidies in the social protection sector. To give you a sense, so the fuel and the food subsidies represented in 2020 four percent of the budget expenditure, while the social transfer and the social assistance scheme were representing only less than one percent of the budget expenditure. And in addition, the subsidies are not cost effective and not uh, equitable. So the, the fuel, the subsidies are not addressing the issue related to the disparities and the inequities that the country were, were facing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, UNICEF in Tunisia has been working closely with the Ministry of Social Affairs to move uh, and to advocate uh, the child benefit agenda. And for that purpose, in 2019, we supported as UNICEF a feasibility study related, uh, related to the universal child benefit. And this study demonstrated that the child benefit, uh, similar to what uh, Sarah from Thailand just presented, was more affordable, more cost effective in reducing poverty and also more equitable uh, thanks to a benefit incident that was part of, the, of this uh, feasibility study. To give you more detail, uh, so universal child benefit in the context of uh, Tunisia would be uh, more progressive because uh, the poor household have more children. It will be more cost effective than subsidies to uh, reduce the child poverty. On the graph on the right side, you have the cost of one point of uh, child poverty reduction for through the three schemes, the fuel subsidies, the food subsidies, and the child grant, the child benefits. 
in terms of uh, implementation, uh, a child benefit uh, is quite uh, administratively simple because we have a system, we have a social protection system already existing in, uh, in Tunisia. And uh, the children are either covered by the social security scheme or uh, the social assistance scheme. And we have this challenge of the missing middle, but they are register in school, for instance, or their administrative existing in uh, other administrative database. Uh, as I mentioned uh, also earlier, uh, this uh, universal child benefit in Tunisia was affordable before the COVID-19 crisis because it will require only a modest proportion of the fiscal space that can be generated by the subsidy uh, reform. So, that's the uh, work that UNICEF was supporting with the national authorities related to uh, the pre-COVID uh, situation. I mentioned earlier the feasibility study for the universal child benefit. UNICEF also was working in 2019 with the Ministry of Social Affairs for a draft of a new social protection floor law and decree including the universal child benefit. Unfortunately, this uh, law has never been uh, approved so far. UNICEF has been also working very closely with the Ministry of Finance to uh, analyze all the social sector expenditure. And for instance, in uh, 2020, the situation analysis of children and women in Tunisia done by UNICEF with all the ministries included a full chapter on the social sector expenditure. And we are now working also with the Ministry of Finance on specific budget brief for each uh, sector. Um, Tunisia was already uh, involved with the support uh, from uh, UNICEF and the other UN agencies on the uh, South South experience uh, sharing in 2019. Uh, a visit to Argentina to uh, better understand and to share ex uh, good practices related to the reform of the social protection se sector and the universal child benefit was organized. And thanks to the, all this work on the uh, UCB, the feasibility, the fiscal space analysis, UNICEF was able to, uh, to create new partnership, especially with the Ministry of Finance, the IMF and the World Bank, who are uh, key partner to be uh, convinced when you try to advocate for, for such uh, reform. Uh, when the COVID hit uh, Tunisia, so uh, UNICEF, as you understood, was uh, or already well positioned to influence the policy response related to the lockdown and the socioeconomic uh, impact of the COVID-19. So we did this uh, rapid study on the impact of uh, the COVID-19 on child poverty. We updated also the fiscal space analysis for the UCB in 2021, taking into account the new macroeconomic uh, environment. We, we had also several sessions of work with the IMF to advocate for the expansion of the, of the safety nets and uh, with a focus on the universal child benefit. We fundraise with donors to support the expansion of the coverage of children by the social assistance system to be able to respond to the crisis of the COVID-19 and at the same time to start to launch uh, the model of, uh, of a universal child benefit in, uh, in Tunisia. And we launched also a South South Learning Initiative on social protection reform in the, in the Maghreb countries. And there will be a, full, uh, a presentation from Anaïs on, uh, on this uh, initiative just after, after me. As a result, uh, so UNICEF was able to, to fundraise 26 million of euro from uh, Germany and KFW for Tunisia to expand during the COVID-19 uh, the child coverage of the child benefit. And so thanks to this uh, funding, uh, we were able to support the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs for the first time in Tunisia to provide regular monthly transfer to all children under five in households that were outside of the contributory social protection system. 
Uh, so that's all the children who were uh, registered in the social assistance scheme. And to, to give you a sense, we were able with, uh, with the Ministry of Social Affairs so to cover about 15% of all the under five uh, population. When we launch uh, the, the program, so at the end of 2020, we were covering about 40,000 children under five. At the end of 2021, uh, we were covering almost 130,000 uh, children. So we multiply by uh, uh, yeah, almost uh, three the number of children receiving the child benefit. Uh, as I said earlier, we were also working closely with the World Bank, the IMF, the, the, uh, the Ministry of Finance. So the, in March 2021, a World Bank loan was approved approved uh, by Tunisia and also by the, by, the, by the World Bank to extend the monthly benefit for all children zero to five. So from January 2022 until the end of 2024. And in January 2022, a new law has been uh, passed in, uh, in Tunisia. And uh, so this law is now institutionalizing the, the zero to five uh, child benefit for all children uh, who are registered in the social assistance scheme. So Tunisia is also under uh, the negotiation with uh, the IMF for uh, a package of, uh, of support for, for the next years. And in the plan of, uh, of reform that are still under negotiation between Tunisia and the IMF, the prime minister made a presentation and this plan of reform includes the child benefit as a pillar to compensate the subsidy uh, removal or at least decrease in, uh, in Tunisia. So all these uh, measures that are currently uh, being uh, in place and the new law that was uh, uh, passed on, in January of this year are focusing for the moment on the zero to five years old uh, group. But um, it, in terms of advocacy and policy uh, dialogue, this uh, implementation of the zero to five child benefit start uh, changing the mindset of policymaker uh, for the reform of the social protection system in, uh, in Tunisia. In terms of uh, next steps, so UNICEF is planning to uh, support Tunisia to expand the child benefits uh, of children that are in the social assistance scheme uh, up to the age of 18 as part of the Ukraine crisis mitigation response. Um, uh, we are working also closely with the Ministry of Finance and the, and the Ministry of Social Affairs to uh, uh, reactivate the discussion uh, related to the 2019 draft law related to the social protection floor. And uh, we are engaging also with the Ministry of Finance and the IMF related to, enfin, for the subject uh, related to the domestic financing of this agenda, because as I mentioned, so far the under five child benefit is, uh, is fully funded by a loan. We will also work closely with uh, the, the partners, uh, the national partners, but also the union in, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. And it will be similar discussion to uh, what uh, Sarah was presenting for Thailand to uh, align the child benefit with the family allowance value from the contributory uh, system. And we will need to engage with all the partners to document the, the missing middle. So the children that are not eligible yet for social assistance, but are not covered also by the social security uh, scheme because their parents are working in the informal sector. So that's uh, the plan for the next uh, two, three years in, uh, in Tunisia. And, uh, yeah, I wanted also to, to share with the participants because uh, some testimonies from beneficiaries to put a, a human face on uh, these uh, children and their parents and also the social worker to showcase how such a child benefit uh, is making a, a difference for for, for children. So it's only a two minutes video and uh, I hope that Remy, I will have it. I'm yeah. gonna give you one minute because we're a bit over time. So please, okay. you can, I will you can cut, share part of it. I Thanks. will cut the video.
it's not starting yet. كوفيد قلت لنا مش اثر فينا برك احنا ولينا ما عادش حاصيله حتى الماكله خالطين عليها جمله انا تحس روحك في بلاصه ماكش قادر مش حتى تتنفس مسكر عليك الباب شوف صغارك تخمم في الماكله تخمم في الكوش تخمم في هيك تخ... يعني ضغط ضغط كبير برشا ومن وقتها راجلي مرض حتى مشاش للطبي ما عناش معناتها باش نمشي وصغاري زاد مرض ونا مرض تقعدنا في الدار مشينا شعبنا تحليل تقريبا قعدنا برشا برشا ما نخدموش باش تمشي تنتقل تمشي تخدم وواحد ما تلقى فيش تركب مرضت بالكوفيد قعدت ثلاث ايام وفزت نخدم باش تقعد معناها بطال معناها الصغار باش يقعدوا للشر زعما باش نبطلها من المكتب باش تشد لي ولدي ذاك الصغير ولد عامي باش نمشي انا نخدم باش نعاون شوي ساعات يوم مرضي صغير ما نلقاش باش نهز يوم مرض لي شنتي هكاك يقعد لي يرتاح واحد بالنسبة للقبل عايشين في ظروف صعيبة وتوا عايشين في ظروف صعيبة مي إذا كان ما جاتش ثم المساعدات متاع 30 دينار رام ذوم الصغار الزوز ما همش يقراو في في التحضير يعني ما يمشوش يقراو غاديك بس اللبسه نتاعها نتاع بشويه مي تو تحسنت المردود نتاعها ودور الايجابي نتاع المساعده هذه لي جي دي لي في انما ان سفيزون يلزمها تتواصل باش ما نعملوش كوبير معناها مش تو نعاونوا كان نجموا نطلعوا شويه في السقف باش المردود يكون معناها ايجابي اكثر كي نجيبهم مثلا 60 دينار وخلص منهم مثلا مثلا لمجه تاع قرايه وخلص منهم باقي الكوج انا يعني من نكون مخنوقه على الاخر نحس في روحي تنفست شوي هذيك 30 الف مرتها ناخذ فيها تاع زوز صغار كل شنتي 30 60 الف بينيت انا حاجه شنتي نقصتها حاجه كدبش قرارس حاجه يكمل يشري لهم فطورهم لهم جاتهم عاونتني شو cash transfer that uh, UNICEF supported with the partners uh, to children. So, Thank you so much. Taylor, if you want, I can stop the video. And, uh, yeah, I the don't key want, but I need. The key message from the beneficiary is that this type of uh, model should be permanent and the benefit should be, uh, uh, should be regular. Over to you, and uh, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Remy. Really interesting stuff coming out of Tunisia. And colleagues, all of these presentations will also be available on the webinar uh, page from socialprotection.org. So please, you can go and watch the full video there. I'm now inviting Anais to please uh, come and present. Anais, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Taylor. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. So I'm going to present a very practical uh, example of South-South and Triangular Cooperation Initiative uh, that I facilitated together with Remy, who just uh, presented. Uh, this was a webinar series of five webinars that we held uh, in the past year. It was initiated by UNICEF and was funded by UNICEF as well and implemented in partnership with the IPCIG. Uh, and uh, it was hosted in socialprotection.org. Uh, the French Development Agent and the World Bank also supported implementing uh, the series. Um, so as I say, the focus was on the Maghreb region. Um, the, the goal uh, was to facilitate more lead sharing and the identification of good practice among Tunisia, Morocco, and guest countries from the global south. Our focus uh, was in Latin America because uh, we found that they had uh, Morocco, Tunisia, and Latin America countries had similar uh, problems as, uh, for instance, uh, the coverage of the missing middle, the budget constraints for social protection even before COVID-19. And uh, the view was to support decision-making uh, process around two main things. So the first one was the role of social protection in Morocco and Tunisia in the context of economic recovery following the impacts of COVID-19 on growth. 
And the second one was the structural reforms aiming at universal social protection coverage in Tunisia and Morocco, according, of course, to their own goals and priorities of each country. So what we really wanted was to create a space uh, where government officials could interact with each other, could share their experience, the challenge they were facing, that were the, the space that we lost during uh, COVID-19 during to the travel restrictions. Um, so um, we had uh, three guest countries uh, from Latin America, Brazil, of course, uh, since we're based in Brazil, we brought twice uh, the country uh, and experts to present uh, its experience, but also Chile, Argentina, uh, and later we included uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We brought uh, Malawi and Senegal to also present. Morocco and Tunisia, they were uh, in, in all the five uh, webinars of the series. Uh, they also shared the experience and the the issues and the learnings they were uh, acquiring uh, in their own country. Um, so here are the five sessions. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we divided and what we brought, uh, the content we brought in each session. Um, the first one was uh, about sustainable finance of social protection systems and how to expand the dedicated fiscal space. Uh, we brought the example of Brazil, and we also brought uh, the International Social Security Association, uh, which is based in Switzerland. Uh, and we, with the example of uh, Bolsa Familia, the family grant from Brazil, uh, very successful and uh, well-known program, uh, we talked about the, the challenge for sustainable financing. Uh, in the second session about uh, government and the reduction of the fragmentation between social protection programs. We've got uh, first Argentina with the experience of ANSES, the National Social Security Administration, and, uh, and also Senegal with uh, the General Delegation for Social Protection and National Solidarity. In the third session, and maybe the most relevant for this uh, webinar, which is on University Child Benefits, um, we brought the experience of Chile, Casi Contigo, Chile grows with you, uh, the subsystems of comprehensive social protection for children, uh, whose mission is to track, protect, and comprehensively support children and their families uh, through universal benefits and service for children, but also target and specialized um, services for children in need or with greater vulnerability. Um, the fourth session on uh, social assistance and social workers, we've got the unified social assistance system from uh, Brazil. And in the fifth session, uh, we brought the example of Malawi with its unified beneficiary registry, registry which despite its a bit confusing name is an example of social registry and how it helped to respond uh, to the COVID-19 shock. Um, so um, very quickly, uh, as I say, uh, the main, uh, main um, the, the third webinar, the third session was the most uh, relevant for this uh, webinar. Um, here is uh, the attendance we had for each session. Um, I need to say that uh, we chose to have closed webinar sessions. We didn't record. So uh, our idea was to make uh, government officials very comfortable to speak to each other and uh, to share the challenge they were facing. Um, it was quite hard to achieve that, I need to, to be honest. And this is one lesson learned that I'm hoping to share here. And I, we hope that it could take into account in future initiatives. Um, so this part, uh, also in, in addition to government officials, we had people from universities, researchers, consultants who were working with the government, and of course, uh, uh, people from international organizations working in this in these countries. Here you can see uh, the percent, percentage of uh, government participation. 
uh, you can see there was a ha around half uh, of participation. And in the darker blue uh, below, you can see uh, the percent of government uh, officials who stayed longer than one hour and a half. Our webinars had usually one hour and a half to two hours. In the last 30 minutes, we had a space for exchange of experience, uh, questions and answers. So you can see that this was a challenge for us. Um, very quickly, uh, some lessons learned for Morocco and Tunisia. Uh, the main uh, message we were able to uh, pass in each of the sessions. The first one about sustainable financing. Uh, participants from Morocco and Tunisia, they were uh, very excited to understand how the semi-contributory social protection schemes, they work in Brazil, uh, in Argentina, and also in Uruguay. So we brought the example of the monotax. So it's called Simples in Brazil and monotributo in Argentina and Uruguay. Uh, so they saw this as uh, an opportunity uh, to, to work with limit funding and an opportunity to extend coverage uh, of social protection. The second uh, webinar about governments and reduction of fragmentation, the main message we were able to convey was about the importance of having an institution that coordinates both the implementation of social protection uh, contributory and non-contributory schemes and programs. So this was the example of ANSES in Argentina, which is uh, the institution that is able to coordinate both types of uh, programs on the ground. Then in the third uh, session, you say the most relevant for this webinar here, uh, uh, we were able to uh, bring uh, the importance of investing in early childhood. So a very uh, strategic moment for having return of investment from the government. And the whole Chile Cresce Contigo, Chile Grows with Fuel System is based on this assumption. And uh, we were able to convey this message to Morocco and Tunisia. Uh, the fourth session about social assistance, uh, there was a very interesting discussion about the role of social workers uh, in addressing health, education, housing deprivations, and also to ensure the access to public service. Uh, so, so the discussion was about the fact that both of media and family grants in general, uh, they address monetary poverty, but there are also uh, other dimensions of the dimension poverty, which uh, are not addressed if we only have questions. So uh, we brought the importance of social workers in Brazil uh, in following the conditionalities and, and uh, having the home visits and to tracking beneficiaries and their families, uh, addressing other needs that people have. Uh, and finally, uh, in the last session about uh, a social registry, we were able to convey the message of uh, how important it is to keep household information up to date in order to respond to shocks efficiently. And uh, some very quickly, some limitations and uh, lessons learned that we hope uh, we can take into account in future initiatives. Um, about the content, uh, of course, uh, the examples were not uh, always applicable to the reality of Morocco and Tunisia. So for instance, in Latin America, we have decentralized institutions at the local level with a strong local workforce, strong representation on the ground. And sometimes it was uh, too far away of the reality uh, in Morocco and Tunisia. So people could not relate very much. Also, uh, they, the experience from Sub-Saharan Africa, it was very interesting for them to, to understand, but uh, the dependence of external funds uh, was a bit far away from their reality as well, from Morocco and Tunisia. And, and on the other hand, the, the permanent investment from Latin America countries um, that were showcased in this series their permanent investment in social uh, protection systems and grant was also a bit far of the reality. So they, they're more in the middle of this. Um, some lessons learned about logistics. 
sometimes we did everything right, uh, but we fail in simultaneous interpretation, which is key, so people can interact. Um, so this is something uh, to pay attention in the next initiatives, especially when uh, most uh, participants and government officials don't, sorry, don't speak the same language. Um, well, people are very interested in uh, learning more about uh, the countries we showcased, but unfortunately, uh, as we were uh, working with Latin America mostly, we had a limited number of written resources uh, in either French or English that we could share with Morocco and Tunisia, and especially resources that were up to date uh, following COVID-19. Uh, so uh, we, it was very important that we provided them support and translating and some and answering the, the questions later after the webinar, but there was a limited capacity of information we could share with them. And uh, last uh, limitation, as I say, the online interaction with government officials, uh, we only achieved that by the last session, and here you have a print screen of how we try to make this more uh, friendly, uh, more, uh, more friendly environment. We always invited people to open their cameras and speak. So uh, a positive to this session, we, this webinar right now, we're using a different type of Zoom. So it was not Zoom webinar, it was Zoom meeting. So people could open their mics and cameras and speak at every time. But in the four first sessions, they, people were very shy. And later on, they, they, they start speaking more and asking more questions. They also understood that it was a closed webinar. It was not being recorded. Um, so that's it for me. If we have one minute, I would like to invite Remy to compliment me in case he has anything to add because he implemented this series with me. I will give you that one minute, Anais, okay. if you go to the Q&A box, there's a couple of questions for you there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anais. Thank you so much, Terno. I have nothing to add. You cover all the topic, but uh, I just want to, to highlight and flag that uh, this uh, series of uh, webinars were launched because both uh, Tunisia and Morocco were uh, facing the same challenges uh, in terms of uh, coverage of children by their social protection system. And they were the two countries were also launching a similar type of uh, reform in Morocco. There was a king speech uh, in, during the summer of 2020 for the generalization of the family allowance and also the health insurance. So, so the two countries were um, facing the same challenges and the, this series of webinar with the exchange uh, with countries from the south were critical for us to convene different ministries uh, to engage also with the World Bank, with the AFD. And uh, he, as mentioned by Anais, in each webinar, we, have, uh, we had representatives from the Ministry of Social Affairs, from the Social Security uh, Agencies, also from the Ministry of Plan or from the Ministry of Planning or the Ministry of Economy. So it, uh, it was a great platform to, uh, to exchange on the challenges that the countries were facing and the solutions that con other countries from the South have been implemented in the past and what, what can be the lessons learned and the good practice that uh, Morocco and Tunisia can, uh, can learn. So it was a, yeah, a year of uh, webinar, which were very interesting over from my side. <clears throat> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to you both. Uh, I think that is an excellent closing in terms of showing the, the value and the interest in the South-South collaboration and sharing, which is, is evidenced by the webinars that you held, but as well as this one that we're having now and the upcoming GSSD. So colleagues, I think our organizers were a bit ambitious in terms of the, the depth of content that we're gonna have and the time that we, we will have. So we don't have a lot of time for Q&A. So I do want to direct your attention to the Q&A box because there have been some questions already posed around fiscal space, around how to make the advocacy pitch, as well as trade-offs between looking at you know, adequacy versus coverage. So please take a look at those responses and then have a look and add in if you have any additional thoughts. Um, and also I will ask for Anais who is just doing her last presentation. You have a couple of questions directed at you. So please uh, 
if you can dig in there real quick and respond, that would be much appreciated. And now we are back on time. So I will hand over to Christine, our representative from South Africa, to give some closing remarks and thoughts. I'm sure as you all know, the Child Support Grant in South Africa is one of the more famous child benefits, uh, at least on this subcontinent. So we'll be very excited to hear uh, Christine's thoughts. Christine, over to you. Thank you, um, Taylor. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening to, uh, to colleagues connected to this, uh, to this webinar. It's really um, a privilege uh, for, uh, for us to have uh, been with you and have been a party to organizing through my colleague Russell uh, this very interesting webinar. As, uh, as we heard, as we know, um, we're witnessing really profound uh, changes in, in the context that shape the, um, the well being of, of children around the world. Uh, really in an unprecedented um, manner. And for us to have this opportunity to, to learn uh, from each other, to learn with each other is really um, a great way to, to enhance our understanding of you know, the complexity uh, and uh, the ways uh, we should deliver relevant and, and, and timely outcomes for, for children. Uh, as, as Natalia, um, reminded us uh, in, at, the, at the beginning, no, in her introductory remarks on the global context, we we having this uh, conversation at a time when it's really urgent um, to uh, for us to to act and and to make sure that we are uh, supporting uh, our partners and countries uh, in which we work in in a way that uh, that is inclusive, you know, and and, and makes sure that uh, we. We address the, the 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 extraordinary challenges that um, the children are facing. I don't know, Taylor, if I, I I have the time to reflect on what's happening in South Africa. Hopefully, uh, the South African uh, colleagues who are on the uh, on the chat. I know that um, uh, Kitani, for example, who will uh, represent us at the uh, um, global expo in in Thailand, is on the call. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll uh, make sure that he not only shares um, our our experience, our challenges, but also integrates, you know, what we're learning through this uh, very valuable uh, conversation today. Um, mine is just to to then close by uh, thanking Grace and Martha uh, for the leadership on this global South South Triangular Cooperation uh, webinars and you know allowing us to. Uh, to meet uh, today. Um, and also, uh, again, thank uh, Russell. I do so um, uh, in, in the office, but I wanted to, uh, to recognize him also um, in this forum, along with, uh, with Paula from IPC IG, uh, who together did the groundwork for arranging this, this workshop, this webinar, and ensuring you know, um, how successful it is. Thank you, Taylor. Back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Christine. And definitely thank you for the shout outs to the people behind the scenes, because they are definitely the ones that made this happen today. Um, colleagues, we have one more uh, uh, reflecting thoughts from, I'm going to say it correctly this time, Xiaozhen Grace Wong. Apologies for my first hiccup there. Uh, Xiaozhen is uh, acting on behalf of the director of the UNOSSC, and I'm sure she'll have some great reflections. Uh, so please, over to you, Grace. Thanks. Thank you very much, Taylor. You did very well, actually. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for this very valuable knowledge exchange on social protection, universal child benefits, and South-South cooperation. This is very timely. Just one month, you know, closer to one month before the Global South-South Development Expo, to raise awareness, deepen the understanding, and prepare all partners for productive partnership opportunity at the Expo in September in Thailand. I look forward to seeing you all there virtually or in person. This webinar and the upcoming Global South-South Development Expo, I think is also very timely considering the 2023 Summit of the Future as proposed by the UN Secretary General the UN's SG's report, our common uh, agenda, 
represents a vision to renew the social contract between governments and their people and within societies that will include universal social contract between governments and their uh, social contract, social protection, health coverage, education skills, decent work, uh, housing, as well as universal access to internet by 2030. Just now, the discussion at this webinar through the lens of South-South cooperation, social protection, and universal child benefits addresses all of these priority ingredients in this renewed social contract for our shared future. The common agenda also calls for renewed global solidarity and find new ways to work on the common good. The spirit of solidarity and the drive for collective action, mutual support, the way to work together are at the core of South-South and triangular cooperation. Knowledge sharing and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges between social uh, protection policy makers and program managers from different countries and regions. This is the, has the potential to significantly catalyze progress towards reforming social protection systems worldwide, changing them from merely cushioning the social economic fallout of internal and external shocks to becoming key building blocks of an integrated economic and social policy that intentionally tries to reduce income inequalities and promote economic growth and social development. So today's example shared from countries in the global south across the different developing regions represent such a chain and many concrete policy measures can be adapted to similar context. I therefore congratulate UNICEF and IPCIG for such meaningful dialogue and a very systematic way of working in promoting knowledge sharing and South-South cooperation. The UN Office for South-South cooperation continues to support you, support your work on leveraging South-South and triangular cooperation to advance social protection and universal child protection. Um, Examples of our support can be, we organize high level policy uh, advocacy together with uh, you and all other UN partners and member states. For example, we worked with S uh, ESCOA, a high level uh, political forum on South-South cooperation for more inclusive and sustainable social protection system in the COVID-19 recovery. With that kind of policy advocacy, we also couple of effort in documenting those uh, good solutions from the global south on, south -South, uh, on uh, social protection. You will see many examples such as comprehensive social protection reform program, COVID-19 stimulus tracker, uh, in the upcoming good practice on south south Pro uh, Cooperation Volume 4 to be launched at the South South uh, Expo. You can also, of course, find more uh, good practices and solutions from the famous socialprotection.org, uh, IPC IG hosted. Uh, and we connect with that platform. Also would like to introduce to you our South South Galaxy platform, which also have a vast repository of uh, initiatives on social protection, child uh, protection. And that has been um, uh, submitted and shared by agencies such as UNICEF. Um, the South South Cooperation Trust Fund managed by our office also has a clear demand driven focus on addressing issues such as um, gave you an example in Antigua Barbuda in partnership with Social Protection Board, we support micro, um, small, medium enterprises, 87% of the supported enterprises are women owned into transitioning towards digitalization and e-commerce and with livelihood supports to vulnerable groups as well. In Nicaragua, 15 schools were converted into prototypes of inclusive schools, meeting basic standards to ensure conditions for children with and without disabilities to learn together. I saw a question in the question and the answer section about this aspect. 
So this is happening as well through South-South cooperation. In Malawi and Zambia, over 2,000 child marriage survivors were re-enrolled into various schools with support of South-South Trust Fund provided by India, Brazil, South Africa. So all these examples shows the power of working together and sharing experiences and elevating those knowledge sharing to policy papers, policy actions, uh, and practical project support. Uh, we look forward to further the conversation with you all and partner with you to strengthen our efforts to share and connect for a social contract for our shared sustainable future. And thank you very much for today. Great, thank you so much, Grace and Christine. Um, really excellent reflections. And we're just so thrilled to see social protection featured at the next um, GSSD. It's really helping us to put it up on that next level of, of profile. So thank you so much for that. Uh, colleagues, with that, with those closing remarks, I'm very um, pleased to, to just alert your attention to a few last housekeeping issues as we close this webinar. We would love it if all of you can please fill out uh, the survey. I believe it's coming up soon. There'll be a, a QR code that you can scan and provide us a, a survey to tell us how we did on this webinar today. Of course, socialprotection.org is a great resource. You'll find more information on the webinar page for this webinar, as well, of course, throughout the entire website. I believe there's gonna be some more information on the GSSD as well, which is, oh, there it is. So please scan that QR code and provide us a, a report card of how we did today. Um, also in the chat, there's a link for more information on the GSSD, which is happening the 12th to the 14th of September. So if you have any time or interest, please make sure you attend some of those sessions. And just thank you again for your time and your interaction today. We really appreciated it and enjoyed the conversation. Looking forward to the next one. And thanks, oh, apologies. Thanks to all the panelists today for your great inputs and your contributions. Really appreciated it. And right, thank you for everyone. a beautiful moderation, Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, very welcome. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.